Hi, I'm Audrey Cadry, and I'm going to tell you a story about a very cringe person named 2010 Audrey. 2010 Audrey was going through some shit. Her parents were divorcing, and she was being homeschooled for the first and only time ever, so as a result, she had a lot of time to rattle around in the old brain. 2010 Audrey's favorite time of the day was when her siblings would come home from school, and they would hang out and run around and play really socially intricate Littlest Pet Shop games. One day, one of her siblings said, Hey, 2010 Audrey, I had a dream last night that Sora from Kingdom Hearts came out of a portal in our bedroom wall and he brought us to the Kingdom Hearts universe, isn't that rad? And 2010 Audrey was like, Oh my god, sibling number one, that is rad. And from then on, every day after school, and before they would go to bed, 2010 Audrey and sibling number one would talk about these dreams. About our cooler, older, alternate selves who dated fictional characters and had superpowers. You know, normal stuff. 2010 Audrey is me, obviously. These dreams were stories that my sibling and I told ourselves in order to have an escape. A place where we had control over the lives we led. And we were so invested in these dreams that at one point I had convinced myself that they were real. I was fascinated by the origin story. The point where we transitioned from our regular selves bound to reality, discovered another dimension full of wonder, and became the ideal people we wanted to be. That's why when I learned about the shifting realities trend on TikTok, I was intrigued. I knew that this was something that if my 13-year-old self had been exposed to it, I would have latched onto it immediately. Reality shifting, or simply shifting, is the belief that you can move your consciousness from one reality to another through a variety of methods. These methods include visualizations, listening to subliminal audio, and scripting or writing out what you want to do in your DR, or desired reality. Some of you might say, that sounds like lucid dreaming. But the important distinction here is that many people who try to shift and make videos about shifting claim that it's real, that they really shifted into another reality for a period of time. So tonight I'm gonna try to shift for six months. I did it. Okay, but literally how do people do that regularly? I it was awful. I feel awful. Like, how? Now personally, I don't think it's real because if there's anyone who would have broken through and made it to the other side, it would have been me. When I think about how much mental energy I spent wishing to be anywhere other than here and be anyone other than myself, it's painful and cringeworthy. In fact, at one point I was so desperate to go to the Kingdom Hearts world that I actually pushed against the wall that the portal appeared in in the dreams we created with all of my strength, wishing that the portal would open and Sora would be there on the other side. This trend has been going on for a while, and I discovered it through watching the videos of Curtis Connor and Nick Is Not Green. I was afraid I'd miss the boat when looking into the subject again, but shifting is still alive and well on TikTok. Now, as a writer, creator, and daydreamer myself, I wouldn't see this as that big of a deal if people were simply creating self-insert fan fiction and sharing their stories online. That would be fine. The worst crime they could be convicted of is being cringe. The problem is that the community insists that it's real, and they double down when the haters call them out on it. <sighs> Look, if you're boring, just say that. TikTok seems to be an echo chamber where things can kind of just snowball to toxic levels. And in this case, it becomes almost cult-like. A lot of these TikTokers are young and vulnerable. Nicholas Black did a great video on this trend and how it's possible for these teens to give themselves psychosis. So I recommend watching that as well. The reason why I'm bringing this up long after people have stopped talking about it is because I'm concerned and I can understand both sides. I'm not making this video to defend shifting or any maladaptive, harmful coping mechanism. I want to make that clear. I'm making this video to share my experience because I can understand why those coping mechanisms develop. I also think that the hate that the community gets only fuels them and pushes them deeper into the belief, so it's not helpful. I'm not really behind any needless bullying. As a person, I've never really been comfortable with myself. I think I have some degree of facial dysmorphia and an overall disbelief that this is my face. But in a more general sense, I don't like being aware of myself or my existence or the notion that I can be perceived. I've also never wanted to be in the present. My mental time has either been spent obsessing over the past, fixating on the future, or daydreaming in another realm. 2017 was a very emotional year for me and it was when my daydreaming was at its worst. There were times when I would just freeze and stare into one spot, completely detached from reality, and when I came back I had no way of knowing how long I had been there. Even when I wasn't using it as a way to escape from negative situations or emotions, even the good things in my life would trigger daydream episodes. I had basically trained myself to daydream anytime my mind wasn't occupied by something else. And given my ADHD and aversion to boredom and the empty space in my brain, 
it happened a lot. There was one time when I was trying to do the dishes and I tried to see how long I could go without daydreaming or scripting scenes in my head and I didn't last two minutes. There was another time where something good had happened and I just sat there on a beanbag chair and I couldn't do anything for about two hours. I was just daydreaming and that was it. Now daydreaming itself isn't bad. Fan fiction itself isn't bad. Meditation isn't bad. These can be great outlets for a person to work through problems. There were times when daydreaming was actually helpful for me. Um, there was a time when I was in therapy in 2017 and I created these different characters that represented different parts of myself and I had like assigned each one to like a finger on my hand so I could remember them. And when I brought it up to my therapist, he encouraged it and thought it was great. I had conversations in my head with these characters to learn about myself to self-soothe or just for fun. On the opposite side, I sometimes got so anxious that I couldn't do anything but write about the daydream that I was currently immersed in. The reason creative people are drawn to daydreaming is because of the rush of making something, even if it's just in your head. The more you practice, the better you get, and it's a coping mechanism that can be used at any time or place. It's safe and has no limits. Combine this with the sometimes intense attachment to fictional characters and fandoms, and you've got the perfect storm of escapism. Instead of facing a life you don't want in a bleak reality, you can be whisked away by Draco Malfoy, or Spider-Man, or Filch? But daydreaming is a solitary coping mechanism. Instead of being an oasis, it can train you to get lost in your own head and retreat from your life. In moderation, it's pretty harmless, but it can become addictive and harmful. Believing that a person can shift to another reality where they can be who they want to be and live a life away from the one that they have is outlandish, but a creative person can be driven to diving deep into it if they are already in need of a coping mechanism. Possibly one of the scariest side effects of the human mind is its ability to convince itself of something, like the earth being flat or that popcorn is good. Our brains are weird and dumb and wrong sometimes. Another terrifying human trait is our unsmotherable desperation to escape from discomfort, suffering, and despair. In college, I read a short story called Looking for a Rain God in one of my literature classes. This story is written by Bessie Head, a prominent writer from South Africa. It's about a family of farmers experiencing a seven-year drought. The family is suffering starvation and have sold most of their animals to obtain food. They get a glimpse of hope when in November it finally rains, and they eagerly prepare to farm again. But suddenly, by mid-November, the rain fled away. The rain clouds fled away and left the sky bare. The sun danced dizzily in the sky with a strange cruelty. Each day the land was covered in a haze of mist as the sun sucked up the last drop of moisture out of the earth. The family sat down in despair, waiting and waiting. Their hopes had run so high. They sat the whole day in the shadow of the huts and even stopped thinking for the rain had fled away. One of the family members remembers a ritual from his childhood that involves sacrificing the bodies of children to a rain god. And eventually, the family kills their own two daughters and still the rain doesn't fall. The story captures how prolonged suffering can lead us to do the unthinkable. Our desire to escape the hardships of everyday life is a survival instinct. Those instincts can grab hold of a ray of hope, however small or unlikely, so we can gain some relief. So perhaps it's not the desperation or belief that drives us to the unthinkable, but the quest for hope. The hardest part about observing the shifting realities trend is trying to make the argument in favor of abandoning the daydream and embracing reality. Because what are they embracing? Society collapsing? The planet boiling? The last two years have been filled with plague, outrage, and isolation. I understand that many people have nothing good to return to when they leave their dreams and wake up in reality. I can't imagine being a teenager during this time. It must be overwhelming and exhausting. So I don't really know what to say. I don't want to be living through these things either. I understand why you'd rather imagine that you're living at Hogwarts or fighting crime with the Avengers. Transitioning from being a person who is heavily dependent on daydreaming as a coping mechanism is tricky. There are going to be times when your imagination simply isn't enough, and that's painful. There are going to be times when your flaws or circumstances or mental illnesses can't be fought back with a daydream. And if that's your primary coping mechanism, it's very difficult to keep from spiraling. I can say that from experience. The most difficult thing is walking away from creating, because that's where the joy is. You grow attached to the characters you imagine interacting with, the plot you've built from the ground up, the new self you've constructed. But you can create outside of your head. It won't be perfect, it may be clumsy, it won't be like you imagined it, but it will exist it'll be tangible. So I'd say don't stop creating. Let yourself create in the real world.
Right now, I am healthier mentally than I've ever been, so I have no need to escape from reality, although I have plenty of reasons to. I will always treasure these stories I created with my sibling when I was younger. That escape from reality was a natural, creative response to what we were going through, and it allowed me to have some fond memories of that year. But hiding in a fictional alternate reality isn't actually what got me through that difficult time. It was the bonding with my sibling and the collaboration on a story together that was the true coping mechanism. And I imagine that's part of the reason why people People in the shifting community cling to the idea, even after failing to shift for long periods of time. Interacting with and comforting each other while they search for relief probably does them some good, but the downsides to shifting as a coping mechanism are just too harmful. I know I'm not going to convince people who are really hardcore into this or are successfully profiting from it and making content out of it. I get it. My hope is that the people who are using it as a coping mechanism can begin to separate themselves from their daydreams and channel that energy into the current reality. Find a community that isn't centered on shifting, build a support network, get a therapist. It's going to be difficult work, but if someone who was as lost in their own head as I was can find their way out, you can too. Thank you for watching please consider subscribing. I make commentary videos every other week, and on the off week, I make silly comedy videos. Give this a like and tell me what you think in the comments below. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Audrey Cadry. And with that, I'll see you next week. Double thumbs up, finger guns, high five.